Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now, this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother, Wesley. And today we're discussing a Christmas selection because Iris chose a weird one, Harry Potter and the Saltburn Vampire. Whoa, I was going with Promising Young Man. (laughs) Saltburn feels like an aggressive, scary, Skyfall style title, doesn't it? It does. I wonder if there's a historical Saltburn house, like family house, but it has the vibe of summer and sunburns and swimming. Yeah. So I get it. What was your alternate title? Harry Potter and the Saltburn Vampire. (laughs) Because Barry Keoghan's Oliver Quick has those eyes, the eyes. Yeah. But I honestly, I was thinking, God, he's kind of creepy. He's kind of like a vampire before he said it, where he definitely earned that nickname. (laughs) I was still thinking... There was something vampire about him. And I was waiting for not just things to go wrong, as they certainly seem to be headed in that direction. But I I didn't expect him to go quite that wrong. Like consume the whole family and take over the estate? You didn't think his aspirations were that high? Right. So this movie had a weird Disneyland, what's it called? The Disneyland effect, where Mm -hmm. something is so real and amazing, you're like, whoa, this is like Disneyland. You compare something real and amazing to something fake. Right. That's actually emulating the real and amazing thing. Yeah. Um, I had this weird moment, which is why I called it Harry Potter, because he walks into school and he meets that really annoying Ron character, that maths Ron guy who had like had the outburst. The other no friend Norman. Right. And so we were we were and he was walking through the dining hall or whatever. And I was like, dude, that's straight out of Harry Potter. He's so obviously the poor kid. And then they mentioned that he was at Oxford. And I was like, it is Oxford. It's the hall where they filmed the Harry Potter dining (laughs) hall, like the main hall, because you and I went there when we went to London and we saw it. We went to Oxford. It was basically it sans the floating candles. Right. It was enchanted sky. It was so weird. And (laughs) and then this reminded me of so many other movies, almost like a Tarantino style homage to different movies, all disparate movies where you're like, that scene doesn't have any place in this movie. And yet here here it is in this movie style context. Hmm. Fast forwarding to the end and the risky business style dance. Uh, I put it more as a love actually dance when Hugh Grant is very awkwardly dancing through Downing Street. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Love Actually, our holiday discussion for which is available at orwhatevermovies.com or wherever you get podcasts. Also, it's kind of a booty shaking dance. I guess it's more tailored to Barry Keoghan's character of Oliver than it is to the prime minister. Or were you thinking of the Gatsby-esque extravaganza for Oliver Quick's birthday? Yeah, Gatsby is definitely on your radar. That, to me, rang more of Romeo plus Juliet. You mean the other Boslerman movie? Oh, yeah. I guess that makes sense. Um, There was a lot of uh, the talented Mr. Ripley in there. A lot. And then even for a little while when I I, I kind of expected Barry to... Barry. When I expected Oliver to be a vampire, there was a little bit of shining in there. 
Oh, interesting. Saltburn, the estate, was contributing to Oliver's like succumbing to his e- the evil within him. Yeah, it's like this weird microcosmic fixed in time and space place that removes all the inhibitions and the rules. It's like this dreamy nightmare scape complete with a hedge maze. Which also was kind of Goblet of Fiery out of Harry Potter. Yeah, I can see that. Although I wouldn't call Saltburn a microcosm. That thing was sprawling. Right. I like how their little 200-person party was like a blowout. Yeah, but also typical. Typical (laughs) of what? Yeah, we should have a birthday party. 100 people? 200 people? And he's like, um... Right. But that was it was like at capacity and it was totally normal. It seemed normal. They like had all the protocol in place. They know to clean everything up and put little floaty flowers in the pond or whatever. Right, right, right. The uh, Wilson Phillips wedding flowers. (laughs) Are you talking? Is that a reference to Bridesmaids? (laughs) Yes, it is. Bridesmaids, you mean the other movie about the poor person infiltrating the rich world and then going mad? (laughs) I'm poor. (laughs) But he definitely, he's definitely wandering around like a Romeo in his Midsummer Night's Dream antlers. <laughs> uh, were we supposed to feel sympathy for Oliver when nobody knows his name, when they're singing happy birthday to him and nobody knows his name? No, I think that was the moment where he felt... He didn't feel in control, but he definitely wasn't as put out as he thought. He wasn't all crying and apologetic. He was just working the plan, I think. Well, I don't know, because he was being kicked out of the house. But I think his plan was so firmly in place that he's like, I'm the man now, dog. And he was all like rolling with it. But then no one knew who he was. He was literally the center of the party. And yet no one knew or cared who he was. He definitely had like the killer level sociopathic vibe going where he's like, don't get distracted. Stick to the plan. Don't improvise. Kill, kill, Opposite kill. of the killer. He's a much more effective killer than David Fincher's <laughs> Michael Fassbender's the killer. Yeah, poor, poor Fassbender. I think Oliver Quick takes it on the head count or the body count. Obviously, um, our director, Emerald Fennell is also referencing in some ways her, her freshman debut in Promising Young Woman, especially with bringing back uh, Carrie Mulligan in a decidedly different capacity, yeah. with a decidedly different look. Oh, Rosamund Pike kills it. That's her name, right? Yeah, she's great. Channeling her, her other sociopathic character <laughs> in the Ben Affleck movie. Yeah, Gone Girl. Where she's like total cray cray. But this character, Elspeth Catton, the pinnacle of just like, Vacu- vacuity, vacuousness, like there's just nothing going on in that mind, is, in that brain of hers. Is that the case? Is she not calculating? Because she knows how to play the upper crust social role. Like, no, no, dear, please stay. What would, Whatever would we do without you? But no, you must go, obviously, because we can't hold you down anymore. She played it so perfectly. And she, I think there was purpose behind her disarming intimacy with Oliver right off the bat. And she's like squeezing his hands and all up in his face and like, you're beautiful and stuff and hugging him. I, I did feel like she have a, she had a presence, even though obviously, I mean, she was the last domino to fall. But do you think that she was just empty? Well, Felix, of course, is not going to bring home a minger. I mean, give <laughs> him some credit. Are you saying then that her blindness to Oliver's intention, evil intentions was just due to grief? Maybe. And so this brings me to my largest question about Saltburn and about society in general, particularly high society. They're they're rich, obviously, and I don't think that either of the parents have the capacity to make a vast fortune. I think they came into a generational manner and absurd wealth, right? And never had to cultivate skills or, or much of a personality aside from the societal kind of bearing that's required to fit in, to, to be accepted in rich circles and I guess to date rock stars and artists and stuff. Well, they never had to do work and they had no natural predators. According yeah, to very well put. And so my question is, is that all of us and this sort of absurd opulence and indulgence and you know especially in the kids that are all sex crazed and stuff is this all of us it's just a level that privilege has yet to unlock in us like with more privilege this would be unlocked in us right would is this all of us if we had the money would we be this aloof this societally conscious and yet dismissive when somebody who lived in your house for who knows how long 
was suddenly dead. When your own kid dies and you do the formal lunch thing, she's come away, dear. It's nearly lunch. And you're like, what? <laughs> you know, and like everyone's boning each other and stuff. And and I thought uh, him boning Rosamund Pike was inevitable. And it, oh, me too. it didn't really happen. But it reminded me very much of the fall of the House of Usher, which you don't watch because you never watch TV. What? This idea, <laughs> this idea that when you have money, you can and will do anything and yet nothing of real substance. It's like fate has imposed these tragedies upon us or whatever. And the least we can do is enjoy our bloody pie or whatever for lunch. Ooh. It was an entire movie of uncomfortable moments. That's not true. It wasn't just a random series of uncomfortable moments, but there are a half dozen that you can immediately point out and be like, that was the most awkward scene. No, that's the most awkward scene. The answer to your question is self-evident. Yes, the power of this specific vice of money is so attractive that even when you realize you're unhappy or that you're sick or that you are... I don't know, an unproductive human being, the allure is too much to let it go. But how wonderfully primal for not only Emerald Fennell to tap into that, but for you to see that because I can't, I mean, there are not a lot of ways I feel like you or I kind of given our family of origin and backstory and stuff can see ourselves in characters like this. Well, I did expect it to be absolutely unapproachable <laughs> when he walks up to the door at Saltburn and there's no like doorbell or intercom or even like a, there's no peak hole or peephole or whatever <laughs> and no door knocker and it just like opens and, and the ghoul of the house. I fully expect What's his name? Duncan. I expected him to be the head vampire and we didn't know it. He, he looks <laughs> like a ghoul and a vampire. And so he lets this family live in Saltburn Beetlejuice style just to like further his ends. And so the house doesn't fall into disrepair. He's both Lord and Coachman and Dorman. Right. Dracula was a coachman. Spoiler. Yes, exactly. Oh, man. Uh, um, he was the, the face of Saltburn, right? It's kind of yeah, kind of he, condescending and unapproachable and not really a part of any of their fun. We never saw Downton Abbey upstairs, downstairs sort of uh, staff meals or interactions. He was just very stately. He's the caretaker of the Overlook. <laughs> exactly. Circa the early aughts right? in England. But it, it felt like a summer camp, parents included, like Lord and Lady Catton were not above any of the childish shenanigans. I mean, maybe they weren't doing drugs, but they had no qualms whatsoever with Venetia chain smoking at the table or Farley, who we haven't talked about yet, Ugh. you know, doing lines as long as it doesn't involve Felix. Such a weird family dynamic. And again, I thought it was privilege and that, you know, maybe they're not so stuffy, the black tie dinner aside, until they were all hanging out naked in the wheat. And I was like, that's creepy for family, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? <laughs> um, yes. They're at karaoke when Venetia is like draped across Felix's lap. Yeah, she's like in his lap. It's so weird. <laughs> and, and that's like, where I that's where I draw the line. I'm like, that's not family. We don't do that. We don't touch each other. It seemed like Farley was jealous of Oliver getting too close to both Felix and Venetia. And it's, it's just a weird family dynamic, man. And it, it all added to this air of creepiness and uh, that things weren't right. I definitely feel like Elspeth, Rosamund Pike's character, was trying to keep it together. She was trying to have a semblance of family, and they were trying to do right by Farley, and Farley was right that they would never exclude him, that he was that he would always be family. I definitely felt those Gatsby vibes where, you know, you can hang out and you can party with us and stuff, but you will never be one of us. Yeah. The dad was like, look, she wants you to stay. I want you to go. How much is it going to cost? Venetia came at him and said, you don't belong here and you never did belong here. Now let's make out. Farley obviously had his direct confrontation where he was real with him. It's like, you know, the facade and all the socializing stuff drops away. It's always going to be me and it's never going to be you. So suck it or whatever. Not literally, even though that's kind of how it ended up happening. No, he but, just rubbed it. I don't think he sucked it. Yeah. It's obvious. It's all the more telling that there's a carefully constructed facade when you see them break down and just drop all the pretense, which I don't think that Oliver ever did until he was in the room alone with the last domino remaining. 
Even so, he's unwilling to fully admit to himself the love that he had for Felix. I mean, I get that he was saying everyone knew that I loved him, but nobody knew that I hated him, that he simultaneously loved and hated Felix. Yeah. Either he was unwilling to recognize his love for Felix or he was just turning it into overtures for his plan. This is why he did strike me as a vampire. He both loved and lusted for everyone and yet didn't really have a problem with doing away with them, whether by his own hand or by circumstance. Everyone he met who died, it didn't really matter to him except for Felix. And granted, not everyone died. He let the dad live out his life and and like went dormant Pennywise style for a little while. But then he was back on the room in the room on top of the mom and stuff. And it's like, man, it, it, it did all feel like part of his plan the whole time. And he was just indulging his lust in the meantime as a bonus. Okay, so I get that we have to have certain characters in place who are willing to entertain Oliver. But is it just me or do you drop Oliver the moment you get to his house and you meet his parents, including his dad, who is not dead. <laughs> don't you leave Oliver at that house and never talk to him again? Once, I mean, I don't think that it was orchestrated. I think it was a complete accident and Felix did have good intentions because, yeah, his mom probably did call and his mom probably did sound sober because presumably she was. But when he takes him to turn table manor, that was like, so outside of everything. I, I honestly believed that this movie was just going to meander off into space. That, okay, first we're at Oxford. Oh, now we're at Saltburn. And now we're in this weird, dreamy, in Bruges purgatory kind of effect. Or we're in the <laughs> in the, the overlook where the pig costume dude is turning the pig on the spit with a weird eyeball. <laughs> and then so when we're in Barry's Privet Drive nice house. In Prescott. With his perfectly lovely parents, it felt equally as terrible because we knew that he was a liar. And yes, absolutely, you leave him there. It doesn't. Maybe it didn't matter because Felix, because Oliver would have found his way back anyway, for sure. He was too dug in like a tick with the rest of the family. And hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Tulusma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Tulusma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on Electricast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. Because because I believed him when he said you're not going to tell the family, and he's like, God no, because it's kind of true. It would it would be too much hassle and too much trouble. He just drop him out of his life like he like he did his former best friend, and like Eddie. people of privilege do. There also was how really closely this what this was tied to the talented Mr. Ripley. You know, you're becoming a bore and I don't want you around anymore. That's the moment, if not before, where I'm like, yeah, no, bye. Too much drama, too much risk, not worth it, bye. The party was a ruse anyway. Like he didn't need to, he didn't need to be there. They wouldn't have missed him. They could have appointed any birthday boy or girl and the party would have gone on as planned. And so that was Felix's folly that he hopelessly saw himself as someone who was transcending his transcending that thing that wealth does to you where you can't see people as people by trying to be a sympathetic, empathetic person and friend. Like I believed that him trying to help Oliver at the pub was genuine. You know, maybe he saw Oliver as kind of a pet, but I believed that he liked having him around and that he would defend him to a degree, you know, a reasonable degree to his friends. I believed in the genuineness of Felix's friendship, at least at the start. I did as well. And 
I will further that by suggesting that I did find as crazy and weird and unrestrained as everyone was, I got a real feel for who they were as people for better or worse. I did, like you, feel Felix's genuineness. I felt Venetia's sort of quiet desperation and eating disorder kind of thing masked beneath this beautiful dress-wearing sheer nightgown in the moonlight gothic exterior. I, I, I could feel the desperation in the mother's sort of earnestness and almost pleading nature. Like, oh, you brought someone beautiful and you are going to stay right and whatever would we do without you I it felt real and it felt so real that I almost felt like the revelation of all of Oliver's scheming and plotting kind of hurt it a little bit it didn't don't you feel like it cheapened this sort of dreamy lusty tale of of obsession with this family to make it like a murder mystery kind of vibe this glass onion kind of feel well it was unrealistic that he was able to achieve what he achieved partially because i mean it was a big uh, ruse that he pulled off but also because the machinations are not important to the plot what's moving the plot what's driving the plot in this movie are the characters and their dynamics and the and this mercurial character of Oliver who goes from being you know suave and confident and sexy and seductive with Venetia to being fawning and sycophantic and channeling this, the mother's desperation with Felix and so how he went about systematically infiltrating this family and bringing it bringing down the house or maybe just bringing the house into his possession wasn't important and it didn't feel motivated it didn't feel realistic and therefore I think you had that dissatisfying feeling that that it wasn't necessary to everything else that was going on and what was really driving the story man you remember when i bought dad that ipad after his cat died and then i still think it's like the best gift i ever got dad because it's something he immediately started playing with and like never put down yeah it's like up there in the hall of gifts right next to the uh floor mat that you got the girls the gym floor mat right next to that thesaurus that i got you that you've been putting to regular use in this episode <laughs> Really? What word, what vocab word are you putting? I don't even remember because I didn't write them down. And if I have no <laughs> context with their definitions, I was, Iris is bringing it. And even Kelly Ray was like, Iris has a good vocabulary. Oh, Man. thank you, Kelly Ray. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take it down. <laughs> At Oxford education. So we're going to reduce this movie down because you just had a very eloquent and long-winded explanation of the, in, the mechanics finer mechanics of this movie, I'm going to use a term to encompass salt. This is going to be my official review of salt burn. It's a, a term that I've never used on or whatever movies podcast. All right. Making history. Melodrama. Oh, yes, it was. Ooh. Yes, it was crazy and it was sexy and it was wildly over the top, but it was also funny and, and at times silly. And it just like I, I couldn't take it too seriously because from what I was saying earlier, all of Barry's earnestness and his approaching Felix and saying, I just wanted you to like me. You have no idea how much I love you. And there may have been a kernel of truth, but I didn't feel like it was not a performance. I admired Barry Keoghan's, his ability to get in there and fake emotion. But as a character, it never felt real. And that was substantiated by the fact that he had planned everything all along. And while he was appealing to him and holding his face, he had also just poisoned his alcohol. You know, Ugh. so what we're going to do now is we're going to take the remainder of this episode and we're going to talk about what was more awkward. So I've got Ooh, the, ha uh. the half dozen standout moments and we're going to rank them in terms of awkwardness for this movie, because I think we've covered the <laughs> okay. plot, right? Yes, I think so. And let me just preface this segment with I didn't have context for Saltburn. <laughs> A critic had described Saltburn to me as being raunchy with hangover vibes. And I was like, oh, <laughs> no. damn, I'm in. No. Count me in. And boy, <laughs> raunchy, that is not the word that I would use to describe these otherwise awkward scenes that I assume you're going to bring up. But yes, they cannot go undiscussed here at Or Whatever Movies, so go. <laughs> uh, this is in order, but we have to reorder them in terms of most awkward. Number one, okay. bath water. <sighs> <sighs> so awkward intended to be sensational but it didn't tell us anything about quick that we didn't know yeah it was supposed to be like provocative yes number two to which that would also apply ollie the vampire 
I was so distracted by his turn of character, this uber confident, commanding persona that Quick puts on in that scene. Yeah. All of the period stuff, though, I mean, I would imagine that would be way more awkward for a dude than it would for for Venetia. And probably, except she was smooshing him afterwards, which was a little bit weird. Three, Farley behave. That was another one of those moments where he embodies this otherworldly, domineering character. But at that point, Farley's response was the one that was weirder. Don't you as a dude just be like, get off me, bro? Yeah, no, you're fighting. And I didn't know that what he was doing was going to coerce him into behaving. What I think was happening was either you behave and I give you pleasure or you don't behave and I like tear up your junk, which I have in my hands. Uh, Well, you don't need to spit in your palm to tear off someone's junk. Number four, eat the bloody pie funeral lunch. That was just sad. That was just a whole bunch of people with no tools to express their horrible, horrible grief. (sighs) Pretty brutal, man. I just know that it was uncomfortable, which is what this list is. Terrible. Number five, gravesite American pie. I would simultaneously rank this as the most awkward (laughs) scene (laughs) while also saying it moved the plot forward. Or maybe not forward, but like it's he sealed the deal. He genuinely loved Felix. (sighs) He loved the spirit of him, the idea of him, never got to consummate. And I don't think the grave sight scene qualifies. No. Were you not waiting for him to be discovered? Uh, no, I absolutely did. And I thought that Farley was was lurking or something in the rain and, and, and was going to use that against him. I'll tell him if you don't grab my junk some more. I don't really know. And then, of course, oh, we come man. to number six, which is the dong dance. And there was much dong. And it occurred to me that there was almost no female nudity whatsoever. It seemed to be implied and there were sex scenes. But this was mostly a dong fest. Is that uncomfortable for it to be flapping around that much? (laughs) The flapping was uncomfortable. However, it was what it was. And you kind of have to admire the dude for going all in or whatever. Like, that was a really long, I think, uncut scene of them tracking him through the house, dong flapping all over the place. And I'm pretty sure that when they secured that location that they didn't do, like, OK, but you're aware, right, that there's going to be a fully dong flapping scene at the end. I bet you they didn't have that conversation. <laughs> They probably didn't read the script. And even if they did, it was probably like a one line like, and then he does a victory dance and that's it. I No, but physiologically, like I would be like, let's put a sports bra on those boobs because you don't want them flapping around that much. Like, wouldn't that hurt, physically hurt the male member? Well, everyone was impressed at the naked in the wheat scene. Unfortunately, uh, being a penis bearer, I, I'm not in a Barry Keoghan position or a Liam Neeson or Ewan McGregor position. So I don't know. Are you say, Are you confessing on or whatever movies and to your younger sister that you are not, that you're like Japanese in doubt? I'm saying that as underwear goes, I tend to prefer these days in my older age, supportive underwear. And I've never had like a fully dong flapping dancing opportunity like this. So I don't know for sure. <laughs> It was a little excessive. It was there for the shock value of it. But maybe the um, least awkward, right? It certainly doesn't hold a candle to a Graveside American Pie. Definitely not. Let's assume that Graveside American Pie was number one most awkward scene in this movie. Number two, or n- and the last one was probably the dance. So what ranks as number two? Your other options are Ollie the Vampire, Farley Behave, uh-huh. Bloody Pie uh-huh. Funeral Lunch, Mm-hmm. Yeah, those three. What's number two? Mm. Oh, wait, the bathtub. You're forgetting and, the bathtub. And the bathtub. Bath- I would say bathtub. Is number two most awkward? Probably. Oh, man. And then Farley, and then Vampire, and then Pi. I think I cracked the code. Salt Burn 2 is going to be Oliver and Farley contesting the ownership of Saltburn. But to throw it in, they're going to be raising a kid together, like a Saltburn heir, and all at the same time trying to kill each other and make it look like an accident. Oh my God. Salt burn 2, diaper rash, 2025. Return of Duncan. Yeah. <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> you made me snort on the podcast. Duncan is going to be like the referee. <laughs> he has to be there. He comes with the house. <laughs> he is the house. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm going with a melodrama, uh, but not a bad melodrama. I, I like Saltburn for what that is. Definitely an all right movie. What are you giving Saltburn? Wow. Well, I give Emerald Fennell a big old star because this is a this is a incredibly ambitious sophomore debut, and how she got this amazing cast is impressive in and of itself. The performances are impressive. Story is a bit of an afterthought. And like you said, the main twist might have kind of cheapened it all in a weird way. But I'm trying to think of what, on what objective basis, you have to give Saltburn a good. Like, is it the sheer audacity of it all? The only way I think you wouldn't is if it turned you off or made you uncomfortable enough so that you were like, I don't like this, and therefore I don't like this movie. You're right. But even so, that then it would have, it in its own subversive way, been achieving its same goal or intention. And there you have it. A I hope what you thought was a lively discussion around Saltburn from 2023. You got an all right from Wes and a good from Iris. If you enjoyed this review... Let us know, 818-835-0473 or whatevermovies at gmail.com. Check out our discussion on Promising Young Woman, available at orwhatevermovies.com or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to Sarah Talk Solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, you've tuned into a bit of a different type of show. I'm Sarah B, and I'm your host. You can find me on my IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA. I talk about amazing, relevant conversations and topics and what functions that goes on in this magical, wonderful, wonderful city of the City of Angels. My IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA. Electric Hi, I'm Lessa Cadet, host of her Extraordinary Life by Design podcast, where we celebrate women who are shaping their lives one extraordinary day at a time. I speak with women from all over the world about what they do and how they are passionately pursuing their dreams and creating meaningful impacts on their communities. So come join us and learn about all there is to learn about these extraordinary women. Electric acid.